Hi, this is Dan Gimple, and everything's good to go, so let's go flying. It's early spring in California's Sierra Nevada mountains. We're wheels up from Kern Valley Airport and on our way home to Camarillo by an easterly route through the Mojave Desert. This won't be the direct flight. This one's for fun and scouting out colorful Red Rock Canyon and the amazing springtime wildflower blooms of the mountains and deserts. Here's our flight map. So, Camarillo was due south, but we zigzag our way to Jawbone Canyon, then Red Rock Canyon, and finally, the solar farms and poppy fields of Antelope Valley. This film ends when both the camera batteries and the daylight fade about 20 minutes shy of Camarillo. Still chasing after some wildflowered blooms. They're scattered, sort of few and far between. But every now and then, I mean, oh, look at what's in front of us. Nothing anywhere except for one big, big bloom that's on the side of the mountain off to the right. We're going to visit that in just a moment. We've had an unusually wet winter, so we have some amazing wildflower blooms to show for it, and I've been flying around filming them. Where and when the blooms show up is kind of unpredictable, and they're often widely scattered as they are here. We're about 10 east of Isabella Lake. Kelso Valley is to the south of us. Oh, look at that. Here just last week didn't have the bloom of poppies just like that. The yellow is California golden fields coming in at the 4,500 foot level by Onyx Peak. The orange California poppies weren't there a week ago. All of this changes so quickly. In a moment, I'll show you the view on the ground taken a week later when the color really kicked in. After party, glossy page three. Here's Short Canyon just a few days later. The purple is owl's clover and violet is California lupin. The spiky plants are Joshua's and even those are in bloom. Moving on, we're headed southeast along the Scotia Mountains, an arid subrange of the Sierra Nevada. Just beyond them is the Mojave Desert. Make this is bird pass. Make that bird spring pass, actually. One of the minor passes, Walker Pass a bit to the north. No paved road over this. Takes us out of the Sierra Nevada and into the Mojave Desert. Here's our first eastward view into the long expanse of the Mojave. Note how there's no distinct line between mountains and desert. Terrain and ecosystems all blend together around here. These eastern slopes of the Sierra are arid, and the western Mojave is mountainous. Let's recap on the map. We departed over Isabella and flew east till we smelled the flowers of Short Canyon. Then we turned south and scooted the Scoties to Bird Spring Canyon. From here, it's south to Jawbone Canyon. In the eastern Sierra foothills, a bit to the east of Kelso Valley, a bit to the north of Jawbone Canyon. Red Rock Canyon is maybe 10 miles to the east of here. Pretty, pretty view of the Mojave Desert. Out here, this is what's called the High Desert. We're flying over a long, nameless desert slope with barely a road on it and little else. It looks remote and pristine, but it isn't really. This area is used intensively both as playground and testing ground. This is a place for letting off steam on dirt bikes or screaming through the sky in fighter jets. Jawbone and Red Rock Canyons are magnets for off-road vehicles. 
This is also the neighborhood of legendary Edwards Air Force Base and China Lake Naval Air Weapons Station, and this is part of the airspace over which X-15s, cruise missiles, and space shuttles are flight tested. That's much of what this place is about, but no doubt, it's also about its own desert beauty. Red Rock Canyon used to be the bottom of the ancient lake. All of this was lifted up and the lake drained away. We're just a bit north of Jawbone Canyon. These are some of the walls of Jawbone Canyon. Notice that the rounded hill to the left, totally scarred with motorcycle tracks. Highway 14, just a bit north of uh, Mojave, the town of Mojave, the Mojave Desert. This is Red Rock Canyon. For Southern Californians, this stretch of Highway 14 is the scenic main gateway into the eastern Sierra Nevada and skiing at Mammoth Mountain. There's actually an adjoining canyon here called Last Chance Canyon. It looks the part. The name, sound, and the place looks about as western as it gets. These dramatic badlands, mesas, and gulches are where the Sierra Nevada and El Paso Mountains converge. Now take granite and limestone and colorful lava and pumice, wash it all down from the mountains and compress it into sandstone. Then at faults, tilt the sediments up and let eons of wind and rain erode them into amazing shapes. Add petroglyphs, wagon trails, and gold mines, and here you are. We're flying up along Last Chance Canyon Road. The abandoned old Dutch cleanser mine is at the top of the hill in the background. They mine pumicite, which is a mild abrasive that's great for scouring. Again, We're looking north up the spine of the El Paso Mountains to Black Mountain, its highest peak. It's an ancient volcano with many distinct flows of dark basalt on its top and sides. Though this volcano is extinct, the area immediately to the north, where Ridgecrest and China Lake Naval Base are, still has a very high level of both geothermal and seismic activity. In fact, Ridgecrest gets so many earthquakes, it's nicknamed Earthquake Central. During the July 4th holiday in 2019, Ridgecrest had a bad series of earthquakes as great as magnitude 7.1 that did more than $5 billion damage. Believe it, we felt those all over the Southwest. I'm a lucky man, but I Very colorful place is Last Chance Canyon. Next to Red Rock Canyon. A little bit to the north of... Uh, City of Mojave, along Highway 14. Red Rock is a bit of a side trip, so now we double back over Last Chance Canyon and are headed homeward again. A lot of mining here too. Not now, but there was. Back in the day, they found gold, copper, opals, and pumicite. But these days, it's a place to find golden flowers and peace of mind.
For time out of mind, this part of California has been a subduction zone where the Pacific Plate's been diving under the continental plate and creating volcanoes as it does so. 18 million years ago, a major volcanic episode blanketed this area with at least 25 separate flows of ash and lava. That's what gave the canyon its colorful layer cake look that we enjoy so much today. Highway 14 as it cuts through Red Rock Canyon. How long is enough? Is it timeless? Years after will The views are from above and on the ground at Ricardo Campground in Red Rock. There's just campsites now, but in this place 120 years ago, there was a town with a post office, a general store, and plans to further develop the area. A spur of the Southern Pacific Railroad even ran up the canyon to serve as a big work camp here that was building the nearby LA Aqueduct. The town, the plans, and railway tracks were all undone by the desert's inevitable flash floods. Even the modern highway still gets its share of damage. The ground here is unstable and the floods are brief but violent. The instability that made it pretty keeps it pretty. And as they say, a good place to visit and turn into a state park. recap, we've come south from Bird Springs to Jawbone, then we detoured northeast to Red Rock and Last Chance Canyons. We looped back and now we're headed south and homeward again. We're flying near the community of Cantal and over the Fremont Valley. The valley is named after John C. Fremont, the famous explorer of the West and senator from California. Fremont somehow managed to get a lot of things named after him, as did Edward Kern. Kern was an artist and topographer who accompanied Fremont out here, thus all the things named Kern in this part of the world. I guess that was one of the perks of being the map maker back then. Speaking of familiar names, here's one from another part of the world, Honda. Below us is the Honda Proving Center, 4,000 acres with a 7.5 mile high speed oval and 4.5 mile winding road course. Moving right along, we've gone from where cars burn fuel to farms that save it. Right next door to Honda is the Springbok Solar Farm. So far, it's 1,400 acres of solar panels producing 260 megawatts of AC power. That's enough power for 100,000 homes. It's also a reduction in greenhouse gases equivalent to taking 100,000 cars off the road. Two thirds of the farm are already built and the third part is in the works. Here's the windmills near Mojave. It's hard to tell how big they are until you see it up close. That's 120 feet of vane on that truck. With that vane pointing straight up from the mast, the windmill tops out at over 300 feet. In the Antelope Valley, which is the high desert of the Mojave Desert. We're just a bit north of Palmdale, California, between Palmdale and Gorman. Pretty good bloom this season. An awful lot of uh, both uh, flowers and the solar arrays, solar farms are popping up almost as quickly as the wildflowers are. We're still on our way south to Camarillo in roundabout fashion. But now we're taking another side trip southeast to check out the bloom at the Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve. It is spring, so of course, we've got to go. This scene's a pretty good summary of what this trip is about, 
wildflowers and green power all together. Flowers have been here forever, but the solar farms have popped up in only the past five years or so, and I'm amazed to see how much ground they cover now. So, why are all these solar farms here? Because we're just outside of Los Angeles where all this power is needed. And as it also happens, in this desert, the sun effectively burns hotter than most anywhere else, making that much more power available. It's an ideal situation. We're flying almost over the poppy reserve, where apparently the poppies are being a bit, mm, reserved right now. The inset videos from another year in the same place when they're really put on the show. Like I said, where and when the wildflowers bloom is unpredictable. This year, the real poppy super bloom was near Marietta, about 125 miles southeast of here. They say you could see that one from outer space. The actual poppy reserve is on the left side of the low hills in front of us and the scarred area below is used for off-roading and is outside of the reserve. You know, with all the green grass and flowers, it might be hard to believe that this is all normally a sandy desert. All it takes to change it is some good winter rain like we've had. All this color will be gone in a month or two. We're riding off into the sunset over the Antelope Valley Solar Ranch. I'd love to find out why it's a ranch instead of a farm. I can only suppose that they wrangle electrons, round them up, and drive them all down to PG&E. We're following California 138, your classic long and straight but not so lonely desert highway. The inset is of ground views in the same area. of the California aqueduct. All of this water was just pumped up about 3,000 feet from the Great Central Valley, which is just about 20 miles to the northwest of here. This last jog from Red Rock to the Poppy Reserve and then west to the Tahone Ranch pretty much wraps it up. Home base is south over the one last range of mountains, but first, there's one more big bloom to check out. So thanks for watching and I hope this film inspires you to go flying and exploring too. It's pretty amazing out there and I'm glad I could share it with you.